We want to look at the three feedback mechanisms in the liver that control glucose metabolism. And those three are the three irreversible reactions that take place. So whenever you go from uh, glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, the glucokinase reaction is irreversible. So glucokinase doesn't go in reverse under physiological conditions. You have to use glucose 6-phosphatase. So you have to use another uh, metabolic pathway to go back to glucose. And then fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, there's another um, <coughs> irreversible reaction. And then the reaction to pyruvate from phosphenylpyruvate is another irreversible reaction. And so these are the three uh, breakpoints where you can control the metabolism in the liver. So the first thing, uh, if you remember right, I said that glucokinase, uh, in the last video I made on the feudal cycles in the cell, I said that glucokinase can actually be sequestered in the nucleus. And that's done by, um, uh, it's a protein called glucokinase regulatory protein. And so it's acted on by um, fructose 6-phosphate will increase whenever uh, concentrations of F6P are high, uh, the regulatory protein will shuttle glucokinase into the nucleus and sequester it. And that will uh, allow for gluconeogenesis. Whenever glucose uh, is high, it will actually inhibit the regulatory protein and it'll uh, be brought out of the nucleus. And so then glycolysis is favored. Now it's not simply, so this uh, gl high glucose would be, you could say that it's insulin controlled. So insulin controlled. And then the fructose 6-phosphate levels are actually uh, uh, glucagon controlled glucagon controlled. So these are hormonally controlled uh, pathways that will alter the expression of glucokinase. Now that doesn't say anything about the glucose 6-phosphatase which would bring glucose 6-phosphate to glucose. So that's not being altered in this mechanism. We're just altering the uh, up or down regulating glucokinase. So in the next part when you move from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, um, this is another point of control. And now, this is a new enzyme we haven't talked about, so we're going to talk about it real quick, and then we're going to go back and look at the how it interacts in the pathway. This actually is an enzyme that has two functions. So this is a kinase domain, this is a phosphatase domain. And so whenever the kinase domain is active, this is a phosphofructokinase 2 whenever the phosphatase domain is active, it's fructose 2,6-bisphosphatase. So don't confuse this with fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, and don't cons uh, confuse this with phosphofructokinase, which w we usually is called phosphofructokinase 1. So this one enzyme has two different names or two different functions depending on whether or not it's phosphorylated. Under uh, glucagon signaling, protein kinase A will phosphorylate this thing, and it will make this section active. And then under insulin signaling, protein phosphatase 1 will dephosphorylate this and then make this side active. So now let's look and see what happens when one side's active and, or the other side's active. So what we have here is um, whenever glucagon is uh, signaling protein kinase A, we'll get this, and th so this is just representing that we have a sequence of amino acids, and we're uh, focusing on this sequence over here, and we're focusing on the kinase sequence over here. So under glucagon signaling, we get this enzyme, this whole thing phosphorylated, and this fructose bisphosphatase 2 becomes the active signal. And then, of course, under insulin signaling, uh, phosphoprotein phosphatase will activate the kinase section, the phosphofructokinase 2. Now, what this enzyme does is it will take the fructose 6 phosphate and it will either convert it into fructose 2 6 bisphosphate or it will convert it back into fructose 6 phosphate. So you'll remember you have glucose 6-phosphate, which gets converted into fructose 6-phosphate, and that usually gets converted into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate.
is phosphate. But we have this second messenger here, this fructose 2 6 bisphosphate, that uh, gets created whenever we have insulin signaling. So this phosphofructokinase 2 will act on fructose 6 phosphate, creating this fructose 2 6 bisphosphate. And so under insulin signaling, fructose 2 6 bisphosphate will actually enhance this reaction right here to create fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And then under uh, glucagon signaling, we get the phosphatase. So we're going to remove one of these phosphate groups and convert this back into fructose 6-phosphate. So by re lowering this concentration, we actually, we actually uh, help to move the reaction backwards. So all of what I just said is basically demonstrated right here. So fructose 6-phosphate gets converted into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And that happens by uh, phosphofructokinase. So whenever fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is high, it helps phosphofructokinase make more fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So the, whenever this bisphosphate's high, it helps this bisphosphate to get high. And then whenever that's taken away, it actually helps uh, to go back to fructose 6-phosphate. It enhances low concentrations, enhance the fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. So this, uh, this, in, this sugar, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, is acting as a second messenger. And it's doing so through a very com or a a bimodal enzyme. The enzyme. This is one of the few enzymes that's either uh, left or it's right. But now I'm not going to say that every one of these bimodal enzymes. And I don't know if that's a real term, bimodal, but that's a term I'm using. So I'm going to say I'm coining that term. This this bi this bimodal enzyme. It's a uh, it's either, so there may be several of these enzymes in the cell and most of them, so most of them will be either right or left, while some, the remainder may not be. So what I'm saying is if I have, if I have five of these in the cell, depending on cell signaling, I would expect four of them to be in one position and possibly one, because you never always, uh, all one way or not the other. But this is one of the few enzymes where if it's acting this way, it can't act this way because its, it's conformation changes on the addition of a phosphate group or the, the subtraction of that phosphate group. Now next you remember uh, from phosphenolpyruvate to pyruvate, this is a step that gets controlled as well. And so what we see here is we got this uh, pyruvate kinase, and it can either be less active or it can be more active. This the theme is nothing is either all or none. It's either less or more. So the th if uh, pyruvate kinase gets phosphorylated, it's less active. So what would phosphorylate or what would uh, indicate or what would cause it to be phosphorylated? Well, first of all, if we're if we're at PEP and we're going towards pyruvate. The one thing that would be indicative is if we have a low amount of ATP, we want to make more ATP. So we want to go through glycolysis, then we want to go through the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So if we have a low amount of ATP, we want to activate pyruvate kinase. But if we have a high amount of ATP, we probably want to deactivate it. So high ATP slows this thing down. And then another thing is alanine. Alanine is an amino acid, so it's an amino acid that's used to, we, we basically will break it down and we'll use it for gluconeogenesis. One of those amino acids used for gluconeogenesis. And so if alanine is high, we want to not go to pyruvate, we want to go back the other way. So high alanine will uh, turn this off as well. But there's another half of that reaction. So we just looked at this half, pyruvate kinase. Do we want to make pyruvate or not? So if alanine is high, it turns it, it, it lowers pyruvate kinase. If ATP is high, it lowers pyruvate kinase. 
Uh, on the other hand, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, if that's high, it, it drives the reaction downward. So on this side, we have two enzymes. So pyruvate carboxylase turns uh, pyruvate to oxaloacetate, and then phosphenylpyruvate carboxykinase turns uh, oxaloacetate into phosphenylpyruvate. So on this side, we're doing gluconeogenesis. So we'll put gluconeogen. So it's gluconeogenesis. And so if we, have, if we don't have enough energy in the cell, guess what? We want to not do this. We want to downregulate it. So high ADP downregulates. High ATP downregulates over here because we want to make more energy both of these so if we if we have enough energy we want to not make any more if we don't have enough we want to do make some more then on the other hand acetyl coa whenever you have high concentrations of acetyl coa that means you're doing uh, fatty acid oxi fatty acid oxidation and fatty acid oxidation means hey i'm going to use my energy from fat to help make sugar. So you, the rule one is you cannot make, so fat cannot turn into sugar, cannot turn into glucose, so that doesn't happen. But you can use the energy from fat to help make glucose. And when you're breaking down fats, you get a lot of acetyl-CoA. And under these circumstances, your, bo your body's saying, hey, it's time to, I'm burning fat, so I'm using that, I'm gonna use that fat energy to make more sugar for my muscles. And then, of course, the phosphenylpyruvate carboxykinase, it is only regulated by high ADP levels. So high ADP will downregulate that.